following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Resurrection, 20th Arcanum, Letter Reish, Resurrection is rooted in the Latin word resurgere which means to research, emerge, to re-emerge. And in order to understand deeply the meaning or the way in which we have to re-emerge, to research, to resurrect, it is necessary to talk about Christ because according with many esotericists of the past they state that the only being that resurrected is Christ We understand that, but from the esoteric point of view. And for that we had to emphasize that, that a statement that we have been repeating many times, that Christ is not a person, but an energy. Christ is a Greek word, comes from the root Christeros or Christus, which means worshipper of fire. So, in synthesis, we have to state that Christ is fire. And uh, Christ is the only one that can resurrect. And this is uh, the main point of this lecture. Christ resurrected within the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Christ resurrected within the body of Moses, within the body of Abraham, within the body of Krishna, within the body of Quetzalcoatl, Hermes, Trimagistus, Saint Germain, Babaji, Dante Alighieri, etc.
Christ is that energy that descends from the abstract, absolute space into the different worlds that are very well described in the tree of life with the names of Atsilut, Bria, Yetzira, and Asia. In the world of Asia, that energy, that fire that is called Christ, descends into the very bottom, the very center of the earth, which is the ninth sphere. So that is the final journey that our energy takes from the ains of or, or better said, from the ains of, into the different types of matter that are within the different worlds that we describe. There is a law related with the solar absolute, which in Kabbalah receives the name of the Ains of Or. The Ains of Or, the solar absolute, is the abode of the first cosmos, the proto-cosmos, which is not a manifested cosmos, but unmanifested because it's within the unknowable within the abstract absolute space because we have stated in many parts and many times in the lectures and in the books of Kabbalah that the solar abs- uh, the absolute itself is divided in three parts, the Ain, the Ain of, and the Ain of Or. The Ain of Or is that first emanation of the Ain of, within which we find a type of matter which is immortal, eternal. The beings that abide in the ains of or the absolute, the solar absolute, breathe light. Here is where we find that that we call the cosmic Christ, but unmanifested. If we want to find the origin of quanta, then we go to the ends of or. Or in Hebrew means light. Ains of or means the limitless light. This light in Latin is lux. Light and fire are two things which are equal. It cannot be light without fire, neither fire without light. So the fire is the carrier of the light. That's why it is stated that the first emanation was that beautiful angel called Lucifer, or light and fire, or carrier of light. That's Latin. Many times we repeat that that entity or that force, that energy called Christ receives many names in different religions according to the language 
the traditions. That light needs cosmic units that serve it as focus or transmitters of its own essence. Those transmitters of its own essence are those cosmic units that are called suns, S-U-N-S, stars. These cosmic units must not have any devolving element within their womb or infra dimensions because every single cosmic unit has its own particular infra dimensions as we always speak here about the world of Klippoth which are the nine spheres within the or under the layer of the earth but those nine infra dimensions exist not only in the earth but in every planet, including the sun. But in order for a planet to become a sun, his devolving or the infra dimensions must be clean. No demon, not a devolving creature can exist in those cosmic units or transmitters. Of course, all the planets in the space, in the infinite, long for that state, for that level, in order to serve the aims of ore as transmitters of the solar light, of the solar absolute. Because that solar absolute, aims of ore, belongs to the seventh dimension. Is beyond the universe. The seventh dimension is always divided in two parts the unknowable and the knowable. The knowable part of that seventh dimension is related with the world of Atziluth, where we find the Trimurtis, Keter, Chokma, Bina, which along with the ends of or form that famous tetragrammaton. So then we find here that those cosmic units or transmitters of the solar light become the center of any solar system, of any galaxy, of any constellation. We have our own particular one, which is called Ors. That's the name of our sun. So the sun Ors of this solar system of Ors is the center. We will say the physical body that transmits the light of the ends of Ors. That comes from the seventh dimension. This is how the light travels from the unknowable to the noble and finally reach the earth. So that is the cosmic Christ. If we take all of the suns, stars of the universe and make a body with all of them, we will have then the physical body of Christ. So that's why we say that Christ is the center, the life, 
of any universe, any galaxy, any planet, any moon. Because it's always in the center, in the core of any planet. But the only planet that can transmit and act with that law, which is the cosmic common law of Trogo Auto Egocrat, which is the law of the reciprocal nourishment of matter, the law of to swallow and to be swallowed. The way in which all the universe sustains the energy that enters into the planets return and must return to the sun by the action of that law. And that's obviously shown in all of nature. Let us see this planet Earth. The energy comes, enters into the core, nurture and transform in the different metals, minerals, and through the plants and animals, as we explain in other lectures. And then after that, we transform with light, is returned into the space and to the solar absolute. That is a law of the cosmic common trogo auto ego crat. The universe cannot exist without that law. So in the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, and animal kingdom, that law is performed by means of the action of the intelligence of masters, monads, angels, archangels, like we explained in other lectures. In all of the monads that inhabit all of those kingdoms in different bodies, minerals, plants of animals, obey the direction of the angels. So therefore, that transformation is always harmonious and perfect. The problem exists, as you know, when those monads acquire intellect in their physical bodies, in the animal kingdom. Because then, they cannot exercise dominion over their souls. And they start squandering the solar light that, as you know already, we explain in many lectures, that solar light of the ends of ore abides in the sexual energy, in the ninth sphere, Yesod. In the animal kingdom of the irrational animal, they obey the law and they do not squander the sexual force through the sexual act. But in the intellectual animal kingdom, we start squandering that not only through lust, but through all the seven capital sins that we know. Anger, hatred, laziness, gluttony, envy, etc. And that is why the planet Earth cannot be a transmitter or a center of the solar system. Because for that needs more development. But those planets, which are completely perfect in all of the kingdoms, that indicate the sun, the humanity of the sun, is a humanity different, made of solar men. So all of the kingdoms transform that energy in the perfect way. And uh, those suns or stars are necessary for the solar absolute, for the Christ, in order to give life, to give it in abundance. Let's see in a study how that solar light transform, transmits, and returns 
or is returned into its own source according to the movements of the planet Earth. Christ is always related with the cross. If we observe how the solar light comes into the Earth, then we have to use our imagination and to understand that the North Pole is above and the South Pole is below. That's why when we talk about the North, we always point above and South is always below. The North Pole is related with the head. Remember that the letter Reish is related with the head. And the South Pole might be related with the Yesod. If we use your imagination in relation with the solar light. So see how the solar light makes the miracle of life in this planet. It does it through the four seasons. If you make a cross in the middle of the planet Earth, then you have the cross within the circle. Then you point the four seasons. And then you see that spring, summer, fall, and winter are related with the cross. With the marvelous miracle of life related with the four letters of the holy name of God, Yod He Bab He. That's why Malkut Asia is so always related with the holy name. So that Christ descends in order to transform the earth. But that law of the cosmic common trogo auto ego creat is happening not only in the planets but only in the same nature in every single organism. The reciprocal nourishment of all species. According with the rotation of the earth and its movement around the sun you find here that the 25th of December the sun starts rising towards the north. In December, obviously, here in the north there is darkness. There is more dark than light. More darkness than light. But the 25th of December and the solstices of winter, that solar light from the south starts rising. I said, with your imagination and understand that yes, sod is in the south. So this is how the solar light rises in the planet. And that's why it's celebrated. Christmas. Or the birth of Christ. Or the solar light. Little by little, the sun is rising and going towards the north. And when it's passing from the south to the north, exactly in the equator, and then the equinox, equinox of spring happens. That equinox sometimes falls in April, sometimes in March. It depends on the movement or the cosmic movement of the earth. So, when the sun is precisely in the very north, the zenith of the planet, according to the seasons, that we have summer, as we are right now, reaching summer, when the days are going to be long, and the energy is going to enter directly, into the chakra Sahasrara, the crown chakra, the Keter chakra, the race of the earth. In order to give life, not all nature is filled with light. 
But then, according to that movement of that energy, it goes down to the fall. Because the sun eventually returns to the south again. And then, we find the falling of the solar light into the infra dimensions. And actually, is related with that famous celebration of... Uh, Halloween. And finally, of course, winter enters again. So that is the movement of the solar light within the cross. That's why ancient Gnostics, initiates, wanted to explain all of that intelligent movement of the solar light with a symbol. Because there are many symbols related with that. But the most beautiful symbol is the cross with a crucifier in it. Because the law of that solar light is sacrifice. So Christ is symbolized by a human being, which is the, out, the goal of nature. Because the human being into the image of God is a symbol of that intelligence. That's the goal of the universe. That's why we exist. Because the solar absolute, the ray of Okida Anok, Christ, Avalokiteshvara, wants to create solar men. There will be vehicles. And the sun is a vehicle of that light, a transmitter of that light. We have to imitate the sun and to become also transmitters of that light. But that process cannot happen mechanically. Because what we are explaining here is the mechanical cosmic movement of the earth. The mechanical transformation of nature in relation with the solar light. That happens mechanically and also intelligently. You have to understand that. Mechanically because the elements that act in that transformation, which are the monads without experience, act collectively Mechanically, according with the intelligence of the angels. And that's why we said it's mechanically and at the same time intelligently. So there we have that that drama that we're explaining here that begins the 25th of December. And it's shown in the transformation of the life of Jesus Christ, written in the four Gospels. It's not a drama that belongs to, the, to Christianity. You can find a drama in Egypt. You can find a drama in other cultures, civilizations. The problem with this humanity is that they fall into the great mistake of believing that that drama that we're explaining here belongs only to Jesus of Nazareth. He's a great master, a great avatar, a great messenger, but he is not the only one. And the planet Earth is not the only planet that knows about this drama. This drama is known by other humanities of other planets, of other solar systems. Because this drama happens everywhere in the universe. In my, the dates change. Because the dates that we're explaining here, the 25th of December, the equinox of spring, etc., is in relation with the rotation of the earth around the sun. But if we talk in Mars, or we talk in Venus, it might be different. But it's the same. Because the solar light will ex execute the same work. 
That's why when that solar light was doing that work consciously in the body of Jesus, that light said, I am the light of the world. And the light of the world is the solar light. That's why in ancient times, Egyptians worshipped the sun. Incas worshipped the sun. And many great religions in the past worshipped the sun. But it's not as the ignoramuses of this day and age think. That they didn't understand what the sun was. And so therefore they thought, oh, the sun is God. No, the ancient people were clairvoyant and knowledgeable. And they knew that any sun is the transmitter, the physical transmitter of that ace of all, which is not a person, but a force, a cosmic force that descends from its own source and gives life into the world of Atziluth, the world of Bria, the world of Yetzirah, and the world of Asia. And even into the infernal worlds. Because that light is ultraviolet in heaven. And infrared in hell. So therefore you find that. How uh, great avatars in the past came and taught about the same. And of course, the goal of any initiate is to incarnate that light. Or in other words, what any initiate wants is for that light to research, to resurrect within the physical body, within the soul, within the mind, within the spirit. And that is what we call, it's called resurrection. Because the only entity that can resurrect is Christ. When that entity resurrects in the matter, transform it. That is what is called transformation. Or we will say transmutation. Which is the theme of the next lecture. So then you find there, That that light descends into the four worlds. But the only world that came individualize that light is that world called human being. So the individualization of that light in our own individual beings is a goal. And that's precisely the initiation. That is what is called the Passover. From the animal kingdom into the human kingdom. And that many explain in different ways. How with the transmutation of the sexual energy we abandon the animal kingdom which is related with the world of mechanicity, the world of Egypt, symbolically speaking, in the Bible. And then we leave Egypt, we spin the exodus, in order to enter into that level or that state of human. But, I repeat, it is not mechanical. It's like many religions in this day and age think that in the final times, the last judgment, God will come and will resurrect them. The people that think that that's why they don't burn their bodies. They burn them. Because they think that in the end of times, God will come and unite all of those bones and those flesh and all the dead will come and to resurrect to think in that way is a very infantile lack of knowledge and, and, and serious matters. We have to comprehend this and to understand that 
that we had to manage that energy. We had to control it by will. Because the intelligences that in the animal kingdom, plant kingdom and mineral kingdom did that for us, and that we were just vehicles in order to perform that for the purpose of nature or cosmos of creation, now in this level in which we are, they gave us as a gift the intellect with which we reason. And only the intellectual animal can perform that. A mule cannot do it. A donkey cannot do it. A bull cannot do it. Because they don't reason. The vehicle that has to do it needs to have three brains. And that's why we have three brains or three nervous systems. The cerebral and spinal nervous system, the grand sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic or vagus, which are the vehicles of that light. Because that light, the ends of all, works through the three primary forces in absolute in the world of creation. Keter, Chochma, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the energy of Asiluth descends from above and enters into our head. From the North Pole. And distributes all that according to our way of life. And the final outcome of that is that what we call Nun, the fish. The sperm and the ovum whether we have the inheritance. But if we ejaculate the sperm, if we reach the orgasm like the beasts, that is going out of the body. How is the Lord going to resurrect if we expel it out of the body? How we expect to resurrect if the Lord is not inside of us? You think that the Lord Christ, the cosmic Yahovah, because that's the name of Chochmah, the Son, the Christ, is the same. You think that He's going to come to us just because we believe, or because we are receiving lectures, or we are reading books, or because we follow the tradition of our religion for centuries? Or because we go to church? every Sunday, then we are going to resurrect? No. Because the one that does that miracle is the Lord. It's Christ. It's the solar light. It's the only origin of life. Imagine the sun disappears from the solar system, and then the whole planet will die. Because life exists because of the sun. And we have to understand that. The problem is that we used to give a, a f- human form. We used to say anthropomorpho, size, divinity. And that's why Moses prohibited, in order to avoid that type of belief. But of course, in order to help humanity, in order to explain this, the most beautiful symbol, I repeat, is the cross and the crucify. Because the whole work that we have to perform in order to resurrect is on the cross, the vertical line, which is the male, and the horizontal, which is the female. The vertical is Adam, the horizontal is Eve. Male, female. The same word cross from crossing. And with that sign you will defeat the devil and the animal beasts that we have within. That's the symbol of transformation. Then the crucify on the cross is a crucified one. Because in Christianity they say it's Jesus of Nazareth, the crucify on the cross. Obviously, in that cross, you cannot put Nero. You cannot put in that cross Attila. You cannot put in that cross Hitler. 
You have to put somebody that crucified himself in order to show that that is the way. It doesn't mean that that is the one that is going to save us. That that person is going to do it. Jesus was crucified on the cross, yes, with one purpose, to show humanity that in order to reach the level that he reached, that crucify one, they had to do it through the cross. And that's the way in order to reach perfection. But here, humanity think that Jesus died 2,000 years ago and anybody that believes in him can sin the whole life and at the last minute he says, I believe in Jesus and then he go to heaven. That's a really ridiculous, preposterous. We have to understand that the cross, as you, we saw in the four seasons of the earth that transformed, the same way the cross will transform us. And that's why the light descends on us below and reach, as we said, the sexual organs. Yes, odd. But we have to return, to return the light. And that's the process of initiation. That returning is a resurrection that is performed in different degrees. First, we resurrect that light in the physical body by teaching the physical body how to absorb the light. And that's why you find here on the card that in the waters of life, in the very bottom, you find only one column. The other carbon disappeared. Only one remains. And that is the spinal column. If you associate the two columns with Adam and Eve, you understand that Eve, the lunar serpent, that spelled the force like the animals, in order to multiply like animals, is no longer there. Because all the energy is transmuted. The sarcophagus of Osiris. That is the sarcophagus of Christ. What is a sarcophagus? Sarcophagus is that box within which is the mummy. That mummy is the energy, the base, the force. Master Paracelsus says that the, mom, the mumia is the base of life for the physical body. If we associate that sarcophagus with uh, noon, with fish, then we understand. If you examine, it is written that Osiris Sarcophagus has the shape of a fish. That fish of Osiris sarcophagus is the same ark of Noah. Noah is written with Nun and He. Nun is a fish. And if we go further, we find the other prophet, prophet Yonah. Yonah. That was swallowed by the fish. Do you see, find the similarities there? It is sta stating us here in this car, the resurrection, that the whole work is performed within the sarcophagus in order to rise from the dead. Who are the dead? 
in this case, could be in two different, see, in two different ways. The dead are us, because we are dead to the spiritual life. And the dead also are those that achieve the annihilation of all those animal elements, psychological aggregates within themselves. But the whole work is a war of darkness. Because when that sarcophagus is closed, it's only darkness. The whole work is made in darkness. When Jonah was swallowed by the whale, by the big fish, he was in darkness. If you study the book of Jonah, you will see how it's a prayer there that has nine steps. Kabbalistically, of course, has a symbol. So then you find that the famous Ark of Noah is nothing else than the planet Earth itself. The sarcophagus as well, and the symbol of the initiate that enters to work with a great arcanum. Let's see first in a cosmic way. The whole planet, Earth, is hay. And the, the name of Noah is Nun He in Hebrew. Two letters to write the name. The letter Nun within He. The fish within the water. Or we will say, excuse me, within the matter. The uterus in this way. That uterus is the earth itself. Or we will say it, that ovum. Because it's most beautiful to say The ovum is the earth. And if we go to the center of that earth, in the very night sphere, we find the fire of Christ. We find Lucifer, the sexual strength, which is given by noon. You see, the sexual strength of the man comes from noon, from the sperms. The more strong sperms he has, more sexual strength he has. That's what the power of Shemshin Samson. So then you find there that when one enters into this path, descends to the ninth sphere, descends to the center of the earth, enter into the Ark of Noah, which is the earth and his own philosophical earth. That's a symbol. Or, in other words, is swallowed by it. By the whale. Because each one of us has to perform a mission. You hear that? Go and preach. But when you preach, first, you have to be swallowed by the whale. This is how Jonah explains it. Because Yod Chava tells him, go and preach to Nineveh. And he flees into another ship and goes away. And then when the whale swallow him and he's vomited, then he goes and preach. Then he is preaching what he experienced. He is preaching what he did. Because he is resurrected. When the whale is vomiting, Jonah is resurrected. And this is precisely what the Master Jesus says in the Bible. This generation is asking for a sign, a miracle. They want to see miracles. But no miracle, no sign will, give, will be given unto them. But the sign of Jonah. Because as Jonah was three days within the belly of the whale, as well the Son of Man has to be in the center of the earth. It's explained there clearly. Center of the earth. The whale, same thing. The Ark of Noah, same thing. There are people still looking for that Ark in Mount Ararat. They don't realize that Ark, that energy that rises from the coccyx, from the sexual organs, 
to the 33 have to reach the Mount Ararat. And the Ararat is the Chakra Sahasrara. If the ark doesn't reach there, then we are swallowed. We are drawn. Because here is where we have the dove of the Holy Spirit in the pineal gland. This is how Jonah found here the pineal gland. But in the beginning he sends a crow, which is a symbol of death. But still we have to annihilate different, th- different things in us in order to resurrect. In order to go out of the ark. Noah coming out with his family out of the ark is the same as Jonah being vomited from the whale. As well as Jesus resurrecting on the third day after descending into hell. As the prayer says. That he descended into hell and on the third day he resurrected. Same thing we have to do. We have to go inside the whale. We have to go into the center of the earth. We have to perform that work within the waters of Yesod. We have to be vomited by the whale. We have to come out of hell and resurrect. And that obviously is related with, re- with rage, with the head. Because that is the only objective of creation. To create a being capable of understanding God. Because a mule doesn't understand God. A horse doesn't understand God. But a human being does it. But those people that don't believe in God, because they don't understand God, is because they are not human beings. Obviously, a human being doesn't need to believe because he performed a great work. He's a vehicle of the solar light. He's a vehicle of God. As we said in other lectures, he's a Yeshua. That trans- transform, transform. The son of Nun. This is something here. Very hidden in the Old Testament. Yeshua, the son of Nun, says. In the beginning of the book of Yeshua. She's the same, the Savior. It's a process. First Moses, then Yeshua. You figure it out. You have to be born first from the waters as Moses, and then Yeshua has to come to you. Or as Christianity says, you have to be baptized by John the Baptist, and then Jesus comes. Different meanings. Same symbol. And that's why Resurrection is experience for the first time in the third initiation of major mysteries. When the initiate is creating the astral body, that's the first experience of resurrection. Why? Because the world of Hod is related with the astral body. Hod is glory. In Hod is where we see the light of the Lord. So when we create an astral body and then that light re-emerges as a human within our psyche because the Kama Rupa, the body of desires that everybody has is an animal body. The Lord doesn't resurrect there. The Lord enters there and those demons Psychological aggregates, bestial elements that we have in Kama Rupa, squander the energy through lust, through greed, through gluttony, through laziness. Do you realize that? So that's why we need to create a body that is capable of transforming that light as the sun does it, and that's the astral body. But after creating that astral body, we have to annihilate the beast, 666, which is within everybody. Because we cannot serve God and Mammon at the same time. So we have to annihilate. This is a process. That's why in the seven words written, a book written by the Master Samael Onveor, he explains there how the initial experience, the birth 
of the Lord inside his astral body. Crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. But obviously that's not the end. Because that's just the beginning of resurrection. After that, the Lord has to resurrect in the mind, has to resurrect in the will, in the soul, and in the spirit. In other words, as it is written, we have to write seven serpents of fire. When the seven serpents of fire are raised, when they rose in the spinal column of the initiate, and then we reach the world of Hesed, you see, in the tree of life, Malkut, Yesod, Hod, Net, Netzah, Tiferet, Geburah, and Chesed, or Gedulah. And then we have the seven serpents of fire. Behold, an Egypt that has resurrected in the fire. Anybody can resurrect in the fire. Anybody that follows, of course, the way of the cross. Because the way of the cross is also related with other elements that we are going to explain in other lectures, in order not to mix this. Then we find that if you want to resurrect in the light, that's another thing. Many initial resurrects in the fire, but very rare resurrect in the light. Initiatically speaking, in order to resurrect in the light, the initial has to renounce Nirvana. Because this is Nirvana. Where the monad abides. So the consciousness is united there. Enter Nirvana. But if you want to resurrect in the light, well, the Lord doesn't start from above. Always start in the bottom. So you have to abandon there and to go down again into hell. And to start there. Making light from the very bottom. That's why it's written. You have to renounce Nirvana. But many Buddhas, many masters of the spiral path, don't want to renounce. So therefore, they don't incarnate the Lord in the light. Which is the most beautiful element after the fire. Because then the light shines in the darkness. The fire can rise. But still those uh, masters can have ego. The ones that resurrect in the light must annihilate the ego because the light, Christ, shines in the darkness, gives light and understanding, comprehension, wisdom. And for that, they need to have to descend into the stable of Bethlehem, the manger of Bethlehem, which is here, Malkut, the physical body, because beneath Malkut, the physical body, you find hell. Path. You find Herod. You find uh, all of those elements, animal elements. Then you descend. And then the Lord, as light, descends within the physical body. And start rising the serpents of light. And then the initial experience. All the drama of that light in a higher octave in each body. And the Lord com comes and absorbs all the bodies and makes their own body. I mean, all, all those bodies become their bodies. Or his bodies, I mean. And this is something that you have to understand because Chokhmah is precisely that descends. It makes one entity with that particular initiate. And that is what in Buddhism is called Bodhisattva. And this is something very important to understand because a Bodhisattva is somebody that already resurrected in the fire. And now becomes vehicle of the light of Chokhmah. And this is what happened with Jesus. This has happened with John the Baptist as well, with Moses, with Abraham. 
with Krishna. After resurrected in the fire, they incarnated Vishnu, Osiris, Amon Ra, Christ, Avalokitesvara, Kuan Yin, Quetzalcoatl. If you go to another planet, they might name it in other ways. We can say it too. It's the same energy. So then, he's being born in danger. And he's in danger because everybody wants to kill him. Who wants to kill him? The Pharaoh. The King Herod. Which symbols, symbols of your own egos, your own intellect. Because still you have ego within. He's been, he's been born weak. Because Behemoth is very strong. But he is just a humble shepherd taking care of the sheep of the Lord. And little by little the Lord showed himself. When he's growing and growing inside, he's annihilating Karmasaya, Kamaduro, and all that filthiness that is inside of every initiate. And then he plays the liar. Like uh, uh, Orpheus. Or like David. And write beautiful psalms. He comes and writes the Psalm 119. Related with the 22 letters. Because he's experiencing it. And gives a light in all the psalms. And Solomon as well. Soli man, a solar man. So there you have it. But somebody can incarnate the Lord, can be anointed like Saul, Shaul, and not do the work. This is the will. But if, you do, if you do it, then the Lord triumphs inside of you and resurrects in the light, initiatically, in all the bodies. When that happens, and then Chokhma penetrates into the world of being, ah, and enters there and waits, and enters into the world of Saturn, Bina, like that sarcophagus, the world of death. And his whole work is to make the seventh day holy. Because he is already resurrected in the fire and in the light. Now how to make the seventh day holy. The Shabbat has to descend into the very bottom of hell. And to work there. With all those elements. That we have. In order to annihilate all of them. <coughs> And uh, if he achieves that, he resurrects and becomes the Lord of Sabbath. You know how the Gospels talk about that Jesus of Nazareth is the Lord of Sabbath, Christ is the Lord of Sabbath, the Son of Man is the Lord of Sabbath. Yeah, of course, but to be the Lord of Sabbath means to annihilate the whole ego. To be clean completely in order to resurrect with the physical body. And to enter into the fourth dimension. But for that process, his head has to pass for a transformation. Raish is in relation with the head. We explain a lot in all the lectures about that head. And that's why, in order to show here symbolically the work with the head, you find here that's sparrow hawk with the head of a human being. And if you see clearly, 
The sparrow hawk is entering into heaven, into the third space of these three cards, of these cards always. He's entering there. And his head is the one that is entering there. That's the resurrection, the final outcome. And is holding two elements, an axe and the staff. Because we have to work with those elements. The staff is a symbol, of course, of the spinal column. The 33 vertebra. The letter Bab. Had to work there. Because this is where the Lord descends and resurrects. When I said the Lord, I'm talking about the light. And the axe of double Sharp, you see a double sharp H ox is a symbol of the two forces the axe. One is the woman, which is the sharpest side, and the other is the man, which is not as sharp, between quotations. But with working with those sides of the axe in the sexual act is how we kill, slaughter all the unbelievers, all the uncircumcised, which are inside of us, which are those elements that like to fornicate, like like to commit adultery. I like to break the laws. This is the only way. This is why you see the bird here, this ox, this uh, sparrow hawk is showing that. The element with which you have to work in order to resurrect. The head, the race, is directly related, of course, with the book of Yonah. Remember that Yonah in Hebrew means Dove. And that dove is the dove of the Holy Spirit, which is symbolized by the spiral hawk or with the eagle, because many religions symbolize the Holy Spirit with a bird that flies high. But the most beautiful symbol, of course, is the, the swan or the white dove. So it's a bird. So Yona means bird. I mean, dove. So then you find how Yonah emerges, or the Holy Spirit. In this way, the dove emerges from the well. And after that, his head passes a transformation. Because then go and preach to Nineveh. And says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, 40 is letter Mem. Or as Noah said, the whole planet will be destroyed with a great flood. The letter Mem. Which is related with water. And that's why Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. To war with the waters. Then you find that after that, Yonah, after preaching, goes and rests. And then Yom Chaba, Chochmah, make Akikayon in Hebrew, a gourd in English, over the head of Yonah. This is a symbol. Because the pumpkin symbolizes the head as I said to you, the symbol of Halloween is already there, the symbol of put it in the internet. All Hallows Eve. When you descend into hell, you realize all of your demons, all of those monsters that you have within. People celebrate Halloween and use different disguises. 
in order to enjoy as they celebrate Christmas, as they celebrate the Holy Week, without knowing why. All of those uh, celebrations or holidays have their, their meaning. Hol- Halloween, or the people celebrating that horrible thing, is equal as when Moses goes and makes miracles in front of the Pharaoh. And say to the Pharaoh, treat or trick. And the Pharaoh says, he says, no treat, and then you will have your trick. And he performs with nature. But that's symbols. Something psychological that still people do not understand. That's Halloween. Until the firstborn of the Egyptian, which is the intellect, or reasoning, or the ego, whatever, is annihilated. And then they perform the exodus. It's a symbol that we had to perform in us. The same thing that happens with the king in Nineveh. In this case, the king says, hey, better if we do what Jonah is saying, and we repent. And they start changing and working in themselves. That's the other part of the story, the other hand. When you follow the advice, and then you do, you do their work. And then when the work is done, those people that perform the work are not destroyed. So when Jonah realized that, and then he feels, of course, he says, discouraged. But uh, if you read carefully uh, the book of Jonah, you have to understand that when Jonah is after and awakes from his dream of his rest, he realizes that the pumpkin is rattling. That pumpkin is his own head. Meaning that the objective reasoning that he acquired with the whole work that he performed at that time reached a certain level. And beyond that level, he realizes that his own particular Jehovah is very deep. And he understands God only in a certain level. So in order, of course, to acquire more knowledge about himself, his own God, he has to descend again, if he wants it. And that was, he realized that in his discontent. And then the Lord says, as discontent you are with your level of reasoning, also I am pity with those people of Nineveh that are now following the path because you, your advice and they don't know what is the right, what is the left. They, have no, they cannot reason between his two hands, left and right. So I have, have more pity for them. Right. So you realize that. So the more ignorant that you are, but if you walk on the path, you receive more help. Mercy. But the more wisdom you add, more pain you add. In this case, Jonah is a a higher level of reasoning. But he is suffering. Because maybe he said, well, I wanted to reach the level of unclad. Which is the higher level of reasoning, objective reasoning. And here, and I am in poculad. Which is lower than unclad. He said, well, in order to acquire unclad, I have to renounce what I have and to go there again to the whale. And that is very tiring. Of course, this is in general, but that's the meaning of the whole work. So that's Jonah. You see, you study the book of Jonah, you will understand the sign of Jesus. That says, only the sign of Jonah will be given to this humanity. And also, only that sign could be given. Coming to my mind in the time of the Master Samael on the Or. At that time, in Mexico, he was telling us, I am having or passing a process in which I am receiving the atoms of my mumia or mummy. If we talk in the terms of Paracelsus, we said mumia. We talk in the terms of Egyptian terms, we said mummy. Right now, he says, I have the whole head of my mummy. 
And what you see here is not the same uh, individual that you met years ago. Then when I heard that from him, only to myself, I said, self, the master is going to resurrect in a while. Because I was studying, you know what I mean, the doctrine. But all the people that hear this, they didn't understand. Still they don't understand. They don't understand that in order to pass this process, also, Mary Magdalene has to come and pour spikenard in the head. Had to annoy the initiate to his death. Who is Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene, of course, symbolizes the wife of Jesus. And many says, for instance, that somebody said in the past that he was a, she was a prostitute. Let me tell you, all female initiates before entering into the path were prostitutes. Meaning, symbol of that is that any woman with the lust within, any man with the lust within, is a prostitute. Prostitutes, the solar light. But after Jesus, or after, better said, Christ took the seven sins from Mary Magdalene, that female initiate became holy, like any initiate. But anybody with the lost inside, that belongs to any religion, prostitutes the solar light. It is enough to reach the orgasm, or to cooperate with her husband with a spasm, orgasm, fornication, in order to prostitute the solar light of the Lord. Do you get that? Do you understand that? As Judas Iscariot symbolizes the traitor, but he was not a traitor, Mary Magdalene symbolized all of those beautiful whites of many initiates that are not prostitutes. But they have the prostitution inside of them. I'm not saying that she was performing prostitution. No. It's not that the prostitutes in this day and age that are going there and ask for money in order to gain their life, to make money. In order to say she was a prostitute is, is the meaning of that. It means that any woman, it doesn't matter how low she is, if she enters into the past, can resurrect. And that is the symbol that Mary Magdalene represented as Judas represented the traitor. But she was, of course, an initiate of a temple. But the, the fact of the matter that she was an initiate of the temple, as Mary also, doesn't take the fact that they had the lust within, because only the resurrected ones have no lust at all. Do you get that? Do you understand? This is important there, because there are many speculations there, and when the people who don't understand the mysteries, they just speculate and say many things in the ignorant way. So, of course, the spikenard is a perfume of the sixth dimension. Spikenard is related to Tifereth. That's the beautiful perfume that shows us that in order to resurrect, we had to bring the forces of the sun, because Tifereth is the sun, the center. And that's to pour spikenard oil in the head of Jesus, telling us, his rage, his head, is transforming, in order to receive another degree of objective reasoning, which is given by the main atoms that we have in the head. The atom of Keter in the root of the nose, the atom of Bina in the pineal gland, and the atom of Hohma in the pituitary gland, which are connected to the three nervous systems. But first the head, but that transformation. And the angel resurrects with more wisdom and become a vehicle of the solar light. That is a resurrected master. Any resurrected master is a vehicle of the light. But many resurrected masters can fall. But let us, the next lecturer, 
the next speaker, talk about that. Which is the 21st Arcana. Arcana. Uh, do you have questions? The question is, in the book of Jonah, it is written there that Jehovah created the worm that uh, hurts the pumpkin and Jonah becomes upset because of that. Of course, the worm of rottenness is created in different ways. That worm, of course, symbol of Decay could be, of course, uh, uh, in this case, in the case of Jonah, discouraged, not being happy with what he acquired, and uh, that may, may be symbolized with those Diani Bodhisattvas that in the book of Genesis is written, they decided to descend or to fall, in order to acquire more wisdom. And of course, that uh, dissension or falling is always coming from the mind. When the initial annihilate completely the Holy Ego, something remains instead of it. And that is called the human mind. The human mind, even being solar, is a human mind. And if you don't control that mind, that mind will make you fall. And that is precisely that worm. That mind, of course, enriches itself with objective reasoning. But it's still the mind always has to want to be more and more and more and more. So that's why it is written. One has to control the mind with a whip or willpower. Because the mind is always stubborn. Because of the mind, many initiates fall. It's a terrestrial man. Fall is in love, fornicates, or goes down. Yeah? In the tarot card, why is the base of the column black? Because that is the way that the person that drawn it did it. And he likes that. It looks beautiful. And we will say that if we want to add any symbol of that, we will say that uh, any flower, any rose, any, uh, how do you say, uh, the, the symbol of the chakras is a, uh, Lattice come from the mud, right? Obviously, we come from the mud. Adam is made from the mud of the earth. So the the white column is beautiful, but remember, it's coming from the mud of the earth. We try. We have to transform the negativity that we have, because this is what Jehovah said. Behold, this couple fornicated. And because of their fornication, their conscience is going down into Klippoth, knowing evil. But they knew good already through evolution. But now, uh, with fornication, they would maybe want to reach the tree of life, being fornicators. So let us kick them out. Because nobody will eat of a holy thing of the tree of life as a fornicator. Hmm? But if they start repenting, with the preaching of Jonah, or with the preachings of Noah, and they enter into the ark, then the dark white column will shine in them. Uh, try to understand the, uh, the purpose of the Christ presence in, say, the world of Asia, right? 
in a nice sphere, whereas I just inhabitants are just like protoplasmatic, protoplasmatic disintegrating bodies. Mm -hmm. So what is the purpose of like the Christ presence there? You said Christ presence goes from Aeon down to the ninth sphere of hell, right? Yeah. Uh, I did you hear the question there? I have to repeat it. Question is why we said that the Lord descends to the ninth sphere, even to clip off hell as a infrared light, in order to help the lost souls. And this is precisely because of mercy. The Lord is merciful. Christ is merciful. He knows for sure that every single soul in this planet, or in any planet, suffers because of the ego. But the ego belongs to nature. So Christ wants to liberate those souls, which are failures. And then he waits for them in a nice sphere, in the center of the earth, as Lucifer. When they reach there, that fire disintegrates them. That's why it is written that hell was made because of love. Imagine, if hell didn't exist, we will be bottled up into the ego for eternity. That will be really painful. But thank goodness, hell exists, the infradimension exists, Clipoth exists, Inferno exists. For those souls that really don't want to do anything by will, they descend, or they fall, we will say, into the infra dimensions, and eventually disintegrate, and eventually rise again clean, without ego. Thanks to the Lord that disintegrate them involuntarily, of course. Because one thing is to do it here by will, and another thing is what hell does it involuntarily. Those souls do not acquire any wisdom. Because the Lord wants to do that, but consciously, with will, in each one of us, now. That's the goal of his creation, to create solar man. But not all the monads want that, so therefore the souls enter there and are disintegrated. That's why it's written that the lay of the Lord will come as a thief, where all the elements will burn with fervent heat. The earth and everything in it will be burned. The Lord is fire. People are waiting for Jesus Christ coming on the clouds, in the clouds, in heaven, to save them. Without realizing that Christ always comes every day, in the clouds, shines every day, and gives light, life every day. He comes every day. That says it's coming. When the Lord is coming, we'll tell you tomorrow will come. And the next week will come too. It's a solar light. But if you don't follow that lecture, or I mean this uh, doctrine of the transformation, the resurrection through initiation, well, the Lord will descend to the ninth sphere, the solar light. And from there will destroy your ego. But you will not acquire anything. You will have a failure. And then you will ascend in another evolving cycle without being a master, without acquiring or being a transmitter of that light. Just mechanically again. Mechanically going, going, going in the will of Sanzara. But then, when Peter says that the Lord will come as a thief in the night, will tell you that physically, this physical humanity will be destroyed by the fire. And you know that earthquakes and fire will destroy this humanity. But the fire of the earth is Christ. The fire that comes from the sun is Christ. The fire that moves the water and gives electricity is Christ. The wind is Christ. Everything is Christ. Yo, he, bav, he. That energy will destroy humanity here. And then, after being destroyed, these sinful bodies that we have, because we fornicate, 
alarmingly, Arad, those protoplasmatic bodies that cannot be disintegrated with the death of the physical body, will be destroyed with the second death in Klippoth with the same fire. The ray of death will take them there and then the soul will be liberated. Finally, after a thousand years at least, descending into hell. And that's why this is how the Lord always creates. It's a great experiment. We are within that experiment. experiment. And the Lord is within every experiment. And the Lord is fire. The Lord is life. It's within the physical body and within anybody. Any other question? So you see, resurrection is something initiatic, spiritual, that I have to experience. Physical, just think about it. How horrible will be this planet if all of those Christians will have lust, anger, pride, vanity, laziness. And all of those Jews also that have that, and all of those religions that believe in that, will resurrect in the end. And then the whole planet will be really the same problem. Same hatred. Same animosity. So the ego doesn't resurrect. Unless Dracula, but that's very ominous. Wait. I like number 42, men. I know it's 1 and 3 equals to 4, it's 40. But why not just the number 4? What well, it means 1 or 3? But you said 40 relates to men. Yeah. Which is 13. 1 and 3 equals to 4, right? That's so you got the 4. The 4 from. But why does it relate to. No, no, I don't want 1 or 3 for 4. Why, from where I have the, the 1 to the 13? So why does 40 relate to men? Because of 13, right? 1 and 3 equals to 4. Well, in Hebrew uh, letters, the letter men has a value of 40. The letter nun has a value of 50. And every letter has certain values. For instance, we resh, right? It has a value of 200. You know? So it's, it's like in the ancient uh, Latin, they didn't have numbers as well. That's when you find, for instance, the Latin numbers or Roman numbers, they find an X for 10, a V for 5, uh, for 1 is like that. And all the letters have also, in the past, they were using the letter for certain numbers, as the Hebrew uses right now. But now we have different. We have the letters and the numbers. Right? So when you said, for instance, you put that uh, letter... Okay, you owe me, and you put the letter Resh, right? Or say, oh, I owe him uh, 200, what, shekels? So, uh, another question, is there another question? Yes, like here. The question is, yeah, I don't know if you hear, that is the Elohim fornicated one time? The Elohim, no. But the human soul, the Tiferes, of those Elohim fornicated in the past, obviously, and this is how they know good and evil. Meaning that the gods, or Elohim, or angels, archangels of this day and age, before becoming that, they were demons. Clearly. Nobody can become a god if he doesn't experience to be a demon. To be a demon is like to be like us. He doesn't need to be really evil, evil, like Moloch, Belial, Baal, and all those demons that exist. Just by fornicating and doing and being as we are, we are demons. But we have the opportunity as demons to become humans. And if we perfect that level of human kingdom, and resurrect, then we become an Elohim. But that Elohim, imagine, that of course, all the experience, you have to annihilate to comprehend your evilness. Obviously, when you resurrect, you know good and evil. Because you are entering into the good 
from the evil. And obviously when Elohim saw that Adam and Eve at that time and in any time fornicated, they said, look, now they are connected to Klippoth. So they know good and evil. I mean, not like Elohim, but at a certain level. So now, let us kick it out of Eden, or the fourth dimension, because if they reach the tree of life, then it will be impossible to, to, to be a master, fornicator masters, right? So therefore, you want to enter again into Eden and to resurrect, you have to annihilate your ego. You have to renounce fornication. But the experience, the knowledge that you are acquiring evil, will be there in your consciousness. That doesn't gone. So that's an Elohim. That no good and evil. You understand that? But you have to know evil before you can know good. Obviously, you have to know evil in order to know good. And you have to know good in order to be evil. Like Nietzsche says, those that do not lie or do not know how to lie, they never know how to say the truth either. That's something very deep that you have to meditate in. So what if someone says, let's just say, you know, I'm going to do more evil so I can be later become more good? Yeah, there, there, are, there are beings that do that, but consciously. Right? There's another, that, as another lecture here. Those beings that do that consciously are the fallen angels. They said, let's do more evil and how the, that evil starts, how that evil begins, well, simple. Spill the sperm, spill the noon out of your body, and then you know more evil. But we do not, do, do not need to do that, because we are already out. So in order to know more evil, first you have to rise, and then you have to decide, okay, I want to know more, and then you have to fall again. But we are already on the floor. So. That's why when you hear something, oh, I fall last night. No, he didn't fall. He has just an accident. Fall the one that is up in heaven. Have an accident is trying to, rest, uh, to transmute, right? But the real fall fall is when you are really in the fifth initiation. That is a fall. Before that, accidents can happen. Because the donkey, the animal, the physical body is learning. And the ego alive inside gives us a lot of problems, troubles. Thank you very much. And uh, next lecture is the 21st Arcanum. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.